Welcome to today's webinar focused on the ongoing conflict in Sudan. My name is Adab Ghaffar. I'm the director of the Foreign Policy and Security Program at the Middle East Council, and I will moderate today's event. Simultaneous Arabic translation is available as well. The in scenes very reminiscent of the 2010 2000 Arab uprisings, the Sudanese revolution started in December 2018 in response to the increase of the price of bread in Nadbar and quickly spread to Port Sudan and Khartoum and other Sudanese cities. And also, like in 2010 2011, police responded with tear gas, rubber bullets, and live ammunition to disperse protesters which resulted in multiple deaths and injuries. As protests increased, so did the level of repression, but the Sudanese people persevered, and on the 11th of April, al-Bashir was ousted. While the aspirations of the Sudanese people were high, as the transition unfolded, it became clear that many of these aspirations would not be met, especially after the coup in October 2021, after the military stepped in. Even though Prime Minister Hamdok was reinstated, he resigned in early 2022, and we knew that the crisis was going to escalate. And while the Sudan crisis has many similarities to other aborted uprisings in the MENA region after a military coup, the difference was in Sudan, there are two centers of military power, which are now engaged in fighting. And unfortunately, the Sudanese people are paying the price. What led us to this moment? How will this conflict end? And what are the role of external actors? Also, what can the international community do at this moment in time? These are some of the questions that we, are, we want to tackle today, a month after the start of hostilities. And to do so, we have assembled a, an excellent panel of experts. Srin Lamine is a professor of anthropology and African studies at the University of Toronto. Matt Neshed is an independent journalist and political analyst who follows Sudan closely. And Redi Berthiev is a senior researcher and associate professor at Uppsala University. Each of our speakers will speak for 10 minutes. Then we will have a discussion. Then in the final part of the panel, we'll take questions from the audience. The response to this webinar has been excellent and we received many questions. So actually in many of the questions, we, I will incorporate them as well into the discussion. Please also ask questions in the question function in Zoom. Please, Nisreen, go ahead, start. Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you to the organizers for convening us and for covering what's happening in Sudan. I think it's particularly critical at, at this moment that we keep Sudan in the news and sort of in people's minds. Um, and uh, I also want to sort of preface by saying that I'm not an expert or a political analyst by any means. Um, you know, I'm, I'm originally from Sudan and was there recently and was um, able to evacuate. Um, so I just want to say that uh, upfront that I'm not an expert um, by any means, but um, hope to sort of give a little bit um, of background um, in terms of what brought us to this moment. Um, as an academic, I really should be going back to the 19th century, but I, I will not do that to you. Um, but I, I do want to kind of start at um, independence um, to sort of explain that um, you know, Britain's sort of colonial parting gift to Sudan was an extractive export-oriented economy that sort of put, um, that, that essentially allowed uh, central and northern Sudanese elites to benefit um, from extracting resources from the peripheries. Um, and a year before independence in 1956, uh, a civil war broke out um, that essentially uh, between um, South Sudanese demanding political representation and regional economy uh, autonomy and the central government. And essentially South Sudan was governed as a separate um, region under, uh, uh, under British colonialism, Anglo-Egyptian colonialism. Um, and the South has essentially been kind of subsumed as a quasi internal colony. Um, and so what we saw from that moment onwards was the ways in which elites in the center uh, reproduced and maintained an extractive war economy to serve their uh, interests and also to quell any form of dissent um, demanding a change in the political and economic system that, that sort of allowed them to maintain their power. Uh, so I'm going to fast forward um, to the 1989 um, um, 
assumption or yeah, the, the, the 1989 military uh, coup that brought um, Omar Hassan al-Bashir to power. Um, and I would say that his, in very brief terms, his reign was sort of characterized by extreme brutality in the sense, um, and, and also sort of a, a two-pronged um, approach to uh, quelling dissent in the peripheries to continue to maintain this kind of extractive war economy, um, but also to kind of coup proof um, from within uh, his own regime. And that's kind of how uh, these two factions that are currently fighting each other, the rapid support forces and the Sudanese armed forces, um, kind of came to be these two different factions within the military uh, in order uh, for him to almost like divide and conquer, but also um, make sure that uh, there was a body that would protect him from any type of internal uh, military uh, coup, which had occurred before in the past in Sudan's history. And so um, the rapid support forces were formerly known as the Janjaweed. They were formed um, to squash dissent and to kind of essentially escalate uh, an existing existing conflicts over uh, land and and water resources between uh, nomadic groups and sedentary farmers in Darfur start sort of I mean starting before but really in 2003 is when this came to a head um, who then really um, perpetrated a genocide in Darfur um, killing over 300 thousand people and displacing millions who remain many uh, in, in internally displaced camps um, at the outskirts of, of towns across Darfur that have been particularly hard hit during this violence as well. Uh, and so the Janjaweed was essentially formed by the Bashir regime um, to kind of do their dirty work for them as a, and, and then became uh, in later years sort of uh, legitimized as a, as a paramilitary force known as the Rapid Support Forces. They were also um, in some ways legitimized by the European Union starting in 2014 under the Khartoum process, which was essentially a, an agreement between the European Union and several Horn of Africa states to externalize um, Europe's border to the border between Sudan, Libya, and Egypt, um, where the RSF really received about $250 million um, to kind of uh, do migration control, if you will. Um, and so, you know, the other thing the Bashir regime did is it was very um, uh, strategic about dismantling trade unions and other types of civil society groups that formed any type of um, resistance to them. And so in December of 2018, I mean, there had been many protests before then, notably 2013, for example, where the rapid support forces were also deployed to, to um, repress and, and uh, kill protesters. Um, and so in 2018, December, um, the Sudanese revolution broke out. Um, and in April of 2019, um, there were about a million people or so gathered in front of the military headquarters in Khartoum. Um, they essentially overthrew Amr Hassan al-Bashir. Uh, shortly after, there was another kind of military coup that put the Transitional Military Council in power and sort of the internal, um, uh, you know, Al-Burhan, who's the head of the Sudanese Armed Forces, and Hamidti, who's the head of the Rapid Support Forces, who are part of the inner circle of Bashir, kind of took over, if you will. And I won't um, get into the details of what happens next, because I think many of you know this, but essentially there was a protracted process of negotiations that happened uh, following this um, coup that put um, civilian elites uh, and the military in partnership. Uh, there was a massacre that occurred in June um, of 2019 that broke up the sit-in. Um, and then we had, yeah, after that, the formation of this transitional government where the, the, the balance of power was always tipped towards uh, the military elements of this partnership. Um, and then after, um, uh, yeah, let me again fast forward. I should talk about the Juba Peace Agreement, but maybe somebody else can, can tackle that. And then we get to October of 2021, where um, a military coup derails the transitional process. Um, and um, after that, essentially, we have another protracted process of negotiations that the international community gets engaged in, the UK, uh, the US, um, and the Gulf states in particular. Um, and really, you see a continuation of that kind of failure to include um, 
the grassroots elements of the revolution, the resistance committees, these are neighborhood committees or committees that are embedded in neighborhoods across um, uh, Sudan that are, um, uh, you know, about 8,000 of them actually across the country that are really the, the, the backbone of the revolution who have been saying from the very beginning, we want a full transition to uh, mm -hmm. democracy and a, a, a um, uh, and no negotiation, no leadership, no partnership, and no uh, legitimacy to these two generals who really are criminals, uh, right? Who whose war crimes span decades, not only in Darfur but also the Nuba Mountains um, and uh, South Sudan. And so um, it's during this protracted process of negotiations that um, we really saw the civilian elites, um, some of whom. Uh, were also armed rebel groups that were included in the uh, Juba peace agreement uh, move more and more towards representing their own interests rather than the interests of the majority of the Sudanese who are represented by these popular elements who were not included in the negotiations. Um, and so as we got you know closer to a political agreement, a framework that was signed in December of 2022, and then the second phase was supposed to be kind of come into effect or signed in April of, of 2023, um, we saw, I mean, there were already tensions between Al-Burhan and, and um, Hamidti, but as we got closer to this date, um, you, you know, and, and especially there was a security sector reform included in this that uh, called for the RSF to be subsumed into the army and for their, for power to be uh, tilted more in, in favor of the civilians, that's when fighting broke out. And essentially what we're seeing here is a power struggle between these two entities vying for political and economic control. And I should mention that the RSF uh, controls more or less the gold trade in Sudan, whereas the Sudanese armed forces control um, about 200 plus companies, mostly in food commodities and other uh, kind of natural resources. And so there's also an economic uh, component here, and I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much, Nasina. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to to start the discussion by giving the background and the context of how how we actually got here. Uh, and also appreciate your comments that the civil society actors were continued were pushed out of uh, any discussions. This is a this is something that we've seen across uh, the region following up following popular uprisings and how uh, political forces are unable to get organized and that's why established forces militaries and so on are able to uh, to step in i'll jump now to uh, uh, matt maybe to to expand on uh, on the on uh, the initial comments by misri and tell us what is the current state of play uh, now okay thank you uh Thank you for for having me and, and uh, inviting me to speak on this great panel. First off, um, the state of play right now, unfortunately, um, can't be described by any other word than than simply heartbreaking, catastrophic. You know, I'll try to use two in this case. Um, what we're seeing from a state of play from a military vantage point is that the RSF more or less controls um, the ground within Khartoum significantly. Uh, while the air is being controlled by the military. And this, in a way, while this maybe wasn't predicted leading up to a potential armed conflict, uh, is in fact, in retrospect, very, very much predictable. And just to build off something what Anastrin said, um, the RSF did the dirty work for the army. So the army historically in Sudan operates very much as 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 a you know a conglomerate that essentially treats the state as a subsidiary. So it's really military Inc, a company in a lot of ways. And in a lot of the in, in that sense, the RSF has been trying to kind of remake its image in a similar way to become more of a transnational company as well. But from the that's the economic side, from the military side, by doing the dirty work for since 2003 uh, and committing all these, you know, in a grave, grave human rights violations, they have battled. They have battled in the Nuba Mountains. They have battled in, in, in Darfur. They've battled in a number of places in which the army and, and army soldiers haven't really done so much. Usually they've aided paramilitary groups or outsourced labor through the air. And so we're seeing these same dynamics now reflected in Khartoum, 
where he's very much relying on its air power in order to stay in this fight, which is obviously very, very important. We see that as a pattern in a number of other conflicts that have emerged, uh, the supremacy of the air as a deciding factor. But the RSF, um, you know, has a lot more experience um, in consolidating ground uh, by any means necessary. And that leads to a, a lot of violence. Uh, what we're seeing now is um, two levels of sophisticated warfare. I think we're seeing more simplistic warfare on the ground. That's quite barbaric, I think, where civilians are caught in the fire. And I would say both indiscriminately and intentionally. Um, we're seeing this with, I think, intentional targeting of civilian targets from the air uh, and indiscriminate targeting by the army. And we're seeing this as well with um, the targeting of sites and embedding itself in residential areas in the RSF, um, raiding, looting, hit, going into hospitals, doing a number of these things as well. Um, and so what we're seeing is that actually the tactics of warfare is very much reliant on having civilians caught in the middle. And that's the point I want to stress. And the reason for that is through the recent um, talks and, and negotiations in Jeddah, which effectively just uh, copy and paste previous procedures that Nasreen elaborated about um, in Sudan since 2019, and really through the history of Sudan's and the history of peacemaking, I would argue very much where it rewards belligerent actors as opposed to actually um, uplifting and empowering um, grassroots civilian components um, as they should be doing. Um, and as a result of that, we're seeing the same blueprint now in the civil war um, taking place uh, in, in Jeddah. And so what they did was that there was a celebration, uh, or I would say, you know, a token celebration that both sides have agreed to um, effectively uh, allow for humanitarian corridors, to allow human uh, like aid to get into Khartoum, for um, you know, we would say for uh, corridors for civilians to leave, and I think this is what ties into the more sophisticated. Um, this more sophisticated warfare, which is information warfare, because now both of these sides are taking advantage of this agreement to blame the other one for actually not adhering to um, to the articles that they, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, allegedly inked with with good intentions in Jeddah. Uh, but what we're seeing is that we shouldn't be buying into that, not just buying into it, because in fact. It is not cooperating with these uh, with these um, objectives within the agreement. That's intentional because if they cooperated with it, then that would hinder the way that they're conducting the war effort. They're relying on embedding themselves in civilian areas, on taking over hospitals and turning them into barracks. They're relying on indiscriminate fire so that it can force the RSF to run and hide in some places since they don't know where they're going to be targeted. So the very fact of civilians or aid getting into the city or humanitarian corridors, that's the very thing actually that would hurt their their strategies of war which is dependent on violating all this geneva conventions so this is the thing so when we're actually you know what we're doing is that we're engaging with these actors in Jeddah based on their rhetoric and based on the war that they're launching uh for information purposes as opposed to engaging with these actors as a reflection through how they're engaging war on the battlefield and then we're making assumptions based on their information and propaganda uh warfare of whether or not effectively they're going to abide by what they signed in Jeddah or not, when really we should be looking at their actions and how they're conducting war on the ground to make that determination. Great. Thanks, uh, Matt. And you think this is going to be protracted or uh, are both sides digging in in terms of supplies? Because you spoke about the military component. Are they both uh, equipped to stand a long term type of offensive? Uh, is the RSF equipped for such an offensive? uh what are your thoughts um yes i i i think unfortunately there's there's two i think fundamental factors that i think is going to push this to be um more protracted uh the first one uh is that i think um the military is and the rsf they're effectively conglomerates at this point uh, one with more fighting experience than the other. You know, the army was a conglomerate that now is trying to fight. The RSF became a conglomerate through the bounty that they acquired through all the massacres they committed in the past. 
So when you have that kind of, of money at your disposal and you have those kind of international back, backers that engage in transactional, not just politics with you, but transactional uh, economics with you as well, uh, transactional, sorry, economics with each actor as well, well, then this creates the recipe of wealth in order to sustain a war effort on both sides. Um, and so I think what we're going to see is the more that civilian spaces, um, civil society, uh, uh, you know, civilian economics is uh, is devastated within this conflict. I think this is going to generate uh, 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 the militarization of the economy again, which has always been a legacy of Sudan, and not just in Sudan. It's not exceptional to Sudan. Of so many countries within the broader MENA, within the broader MENA region, where the employment of these companies, people will start to be recruited for them because it's a means of employment. It's a means of survival. So we're seeing the incentivization for recruits. We're seeing the amount of resources they have to sustain it. And we see the transactional nature of both actors with regional and international um, countries that are allies or backers of them or have cooperations with them respectively. And all of this um, speaks to uh, an accumulated resources of both sides internally and externally that would allow them to keep fighting for a while. And my fear is two, uh, the, the two fears. On one level, I think neither side is really going to be interested in genuinely negotiating uh, among themselves or the others until one side really gets a significant upper hand. And I don't think the international community in various forms, whether it is uh, Washington, European Union, um, regional countries as well, uh, you know, with maybe some exceptions and some concerns that they might have, are very genuinely interested in brokering an end to this conflict um, also until they can see where a clear winner is, and then they'll start to reconfigure their economic and political policies accordingly. And, and unfortunately, you know, really though, the way out to the day after and uh, a way out, I think, into empowering a, a civil future would be um, engaging right now into a, a new civilian and relevant bloc that can be upheld while taking more punitive measures and isolating measures of the two belligerents. Because if we're rewarding military actors again, this is going to feed into um, rewarding the, the like a, a militarized economy as well, which is going to push more people into this conflict. There has to be civil solutions, there has to be civil actors, and there has to be ones with credibility and legitimacy. And I'll leave it there, but but perhaps on the on next go around, I'll speak about who I think those actors that still have credibility are in Sudan. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for a very comprehensive, if somewhat uh, dark picture. And thanks for also mentioning the role of external actors, which is quite uh, important uh, in this context. I'll just bring in uh, Dr. Reddy. Thanks for joining us. Uh, perhaps you can expand a bit on, on the role of external actors and, and just provide to us uh, the regional context uh, as this conflict unfolds. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? We yes. can hear you fine. Uh, uh, probably I, I would like to say very briefly what is the fundamental problem uh, Sudan is facing uh, but not only Sudan, the region and the African continent, uh, especially coming from my, my own research, um, the theoretical and the conceptual aspect. Uh, what I see the fundamental problem of Sudan uh, is the incompleteness of uh, state building and the nation building. Uh, we have been going through cycles uh, starting from 1955 uh, then to 1972 from 83 to 2005 and then again and again. Uh, and that shows you uh, the problem the society is facing in terms of uh, state formation and uh, 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 nation formation. What does state uh, formation and nation formation mean? Uh, in a simplistic way, uh, state is an institution. So an institution which is inclusive, representative, owned by and for all uh, citizens. The problem of Sudan has been uh, certain groups has been empowered while others has been marginalized 
and uh, have been excluded. So unless you have a, a state which is representative, owned by all, all could feel that the state belongs to them and represents them, then the state will continue in a perennial crisis. In terms of uh, nation formation, uh, also nation formation is about uh, having common uh, feeling, common identity, common uh, sense, sense, having a Sudanese identity. Uh, and this also um, fit into each other. Uh, the state has to build the nation and the nation have to make sure the state is accountable to the people. So unless you build the nation and uh, the state, I think we'll continue having the same problem which we have seen for the last 70 years. So basically one has to look into uh, what are the fundamental problems Sudan is facing. In addition to that, for me, uh, nation building and state building is by its very nature political and it is also domestic, which means it is the responsibility of the Sudanese people to build their own nation and their own state. Uh, external involvement and external intervention could only be uh, a supportive additional uh, mechanism. Otherwise, it has to come from within uh, and the Sudanese people has to be able to build their own state and their own uh, nation with and without the support of external actors. And then when it comes to the regional uh, dimension and regional consequences. Now, we can identify uh, the Gulf states and then the immediate neighbors like Ethiopia, Eritrea, Chad, and Egypt. Now, when it comes to uh, the Gulf states, there is a historical, cultural, and religious dimension of the relationship. Uh, in terms of economy also, the uh, Gulf states have uh, invested especially in terms of agriculture, but also they have been supportive for the different political regimes in Sudan, uh, uh, whether it is in terms of economy, in terms of political or security. Uh, so uh, in that sense, there is a historical affiliation with the Gulf status and the Gulf states have been playing, sometimes it could be negative, sometimes it could be positive. Uh, the division of the Gulf uh, states has its own negative implication because we have seen on one side we have Qatar and Turkey on the other uh, the Saudis the United Arab Emirates and Egypt and this has also uh, spilled over not only in Sudan but also the region as a whole we have seen it in Somalia uh, we have seen it in Ethiopia and Eritrea so that uh, regional uh, dimension and regional consequence uh, has its positive and negative aspect. Uh, the second one is the, the, the Egyptian uh, role. Uh, at least in the last four or five years, uh, Egypt's relation with Sudan, and especially after the fall of Admiral Bashir, uh, has been very close. Uh, in addition to the historical relationship, because Sudan is always seen by Egypt as a backyard. So there is a political, economic security interest, uh, which is very strategic. But in the last two, three years, there has been a military alliance, which has been created between uh, the, 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 the current uh, regime in Sudan and the, uh, the Egyptian government. Uh, and then they have a common uh, stand also when it comes to, to the girls. It was on one side, you have Sudan and Egypt, and on the other, you have Ethiopia. Uh, now this will have a consequence because uh, Sudan is not going to focus now on the issue of girls. What is important is the peace and security uh, and ceasefire. So as long as this war is going on, I don't think Sudan will be able to uh, focus on the issue of good. So that has also an implication to the Egyptian Sudanese uh, relationship. Uh, the other neighboring countries are uh, the close uh, from the uh, south, southeast is Ethiopia, Eritrea, and South Sudan. Uh, 
I think the both the governments uh, in Ethiopia and the Eritrea has been very clear in stating that external uh, actors should stay out of this current problem. Uh, and they have uh, had a clear stand that Sudanese should be able to resolve their own problems. Any external uh, involvement should be an additional or supportive. Uh, in fact, they have been insisting that uh, the regional organization that is IGAD should be involved. Even when it comes to IGAD, IGAD could only play a supportive role. Uh, it cannot replace the initiative and the ownership of the Sudanese themselves. So uh, I think both Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea has been clear on that dimension. Uh, so I don't think they will be uh, interested in being involved in at least the current uh, problem. Uh, but also there is a consequences in terms of refugees, in terms of the economic relationship. Uh, if even it continues, it might have other uh, implications, uh, different internal uh, opposition groups might try to exploit the current situation either from the Sudanese side or from the Ethiopian, Eritrean or the South Sudanese uh, side. Uh, South Sudan has also been trying to mediate between the two uh, groups, the two military uh, forces. Uh, so in that sense, uh, even South Sudan uh, was very much interested in having a, a mediation role and trying to create some kind of uh, peace and security within Sudan. So this is briefly what I can say, and then if there are other uh, questions, I'll do that. Great, thanks, uh, Dr. Redian. I appreciate also you starting the conversation with a conceptual framework of, of the core of the issue that Sudan, not only Sudan suffers from, but many uh, uh, countries in the region in terms of state building and, uh, and legitimacy and the crisis of uh, legitimacy that we uh, currently have. But since you were speaking about the external actors, I want to go back to you, Nasreen, and get your thoughts uh, as well. Uh, what do you think about uh, the role of external actors who have exasperated the situation and who can actually, is there anybody out there who can bring someone, uh, bring both sides to the table uh, uh, for some sort of negotiation, these escalation? Well, uh, you know, not only for Sudan, but for any uh, country in the region, but uh, and generally in the continent, a lasting solution should come from within the, the society. Uh, we could have a temporary solution, a temporary uh, whatever uh, mechanism it is, but the lasting uh, solution should come from within. Uh, I think the external actors as, as, as played a very negative role, uh, not only in these two, three uh, years, the last three, two years, but also generally in, in, in throughout the post-colonial history of Sudan. Uh, you know, Sudan has been going on through um, marginalization, through uh, sanctions. And usually if you have that kind of sanction, the effect of that is simply you weaken society. So the, the continuous sanctions coming from the external actors for the last 30 years, in a way it has weakened society. So if you have a weak society and then a weak state also, then uh, definitely we are going to see the crisis and the problem we have now. So the external actors have to be very careful. They should realize any lasting solution is a domestic, especially uh, these are a political problem and political problem by its very nature is domestic because it deals with uh, engaging all stakeholders. I don't think external forces could engage all stakeholders, whether it is ethnic groups, whether it's religious groups, whether it is uh, linguistic groups, because having a lasting uh, peace means having a peaceful society, having a peaceful state, which means there has to be a compromise, there has to be a continuous negotiation, bargaining among all the 
ethnic uh, groups or all the stakeholders. So as long as those stakeholders are not given that chance to negotiate, to dialogue, to compromise, then we are not going to see a lasting solution. We might be able to resolve this current problem, but the resolution will be a temporary one because we are not addressing the basic fundamental issues. And those fundamental issues has to be dealt by the Sudanese themselves. And when I say the Sudanese themselves, all stakeholders who have a stake on the state, on the nation, have to be able to come together, discuss their problems, and come with some kind of uh, compromise. Unless that opportunity is given to the people, and if they cannot own the agenda, the process, so we are not going to have a lasting uh, solution. Great, thanks, uh, Dr. Regi Nasreen. Yeah, I just want to start by saying I think one of the things that was most powerful about um, the popular revolution that started in December of 2018 is that um, those at the forefront of it, um, the sort of unions and uh, resistance committees I spoke of earlier, really um, were not only asking for regime change, but for sort of a radical change to the political and economic structure that had put um, elites in power since independence, essentially, right? And so I think even though for the most, most of our post-colonial history we've been uh, ruled by the military, even the periods of sort of short, you know, uh, periods of democratic rule have still been uh, characterized by oligarchy or sort of elite rule, elite capture. Um, and and that we haven't really had a chance to, to um, experience a popular democracy um, that, is, that is being imagined by this kind of ongoing revolution. Um, so I think that's one important point. Um, I think, uh, and this is partly why I brought up this sort of uh, the history of uh, this extractive war economy. I mean, we've been, the central government um, and its elites have been in, uh, at war with uh, civilians for since 1955, right? I mean, we have, we've had uh, from 1955 to 1973, the first phase of the Sudanese civil war. Uh, then um, we had another phase from 1983 to 2005, and then um, the Darfur uh, war happened, right? And so, uh, which really never ended as such. I mean, it it, it became uh, less intense, perhaps, but um, just because the world sort of moved on from it, and uh, you know, it, it did not end. And we have to sort of understand that um, you know, as a result, for example, our budgets have always been seventy percent or so have been uh, spent on the military um, and on sort of uh, yeah, propping up this extractive war economy that has uh, only benefited elites at the expense of not only the peripheral regions, but sort of rural, the rural economy as well that is sustaining this, right? Um, and so, um, I, yeah, I just wanted to mention that point. In terms of uh, external actors, I think, I mean, certainly um, I study Saudi and Emirati land grabs in Sudan. Um, the Saudis and Emiratis have, have uh, invested over 27 billion over the last two decades in real estate, land, and infrastructure projects, the latest of which was a uh, port project that was signed between the UAE and a domestic elite for uh, $6 billion to essentially 200 kilometers north of our own national project in uh, uh, port, sorry, in Port Sudan to establish a port uh, with its own international airport, with its own yeah, airport and a private toll road that would link this port to various kind of agribusiness sites uh, that have been um, also have uh, sort of Gulf financing to kind of take uh, those resources out. And I think I, I highlight this here because, you know, the, the, for the most part, the external actors that we're looking at here have been interested in extracting from Sudan, right? Whether it be oil, gold, uh, ag, you know, um, in terms of agriculture, it's mostly alfalfa and other kinds of uh, feed for animals, um, but also some food crops, right? Um, and so for them, it's about, uh, you know, si they've been signing deals even during this transitional process with people uh, within uh, kind of from al-Bashir's inner circle, right, who are um, part of this military coup regime. And for them, I think it's really about maintaining their interests at the moment um, at the expense of any form of movement towards popular democracy. Um, and, and then, of course, we also see, I mean, Sudan, uh, as we mentioned, borders seven countries. Um, at the moment, the RSF is um, getting, uh, we have credible reports that they're getting support through General Haftar in Libya. Um, 
who are in turn also supported by the UAE. Uh, there's also reports of uh, the Wagner Group supporting um, the RSF and taking advantage in both of these cases, the UAE and uh, Russia of the gold, uh, right? Gold trade sort of partnering with uh, Hamidi in that. And then on the other hand, you have the Sudanese armed forces being supported by Egypt and other external actors. And um, as my colleague just said, I mean, these are the forms of international intervention that uh, have been going on for a while. Um, I mean, the, the RSF, um, well, actually troops were sent by both Al-Burhan and Hamidi to fight in the war in Yemen on the Saudi coalition's behalf. So they have this kind of transnational network already that they're tapping into to get more resources. Uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis were the first to actually send money to the Transitional Military Council uh, right after um, al-Bashir was, was deposed. And so all of these things point to, to, the, to the ways in which these are not neutral actors when they come to the negotiation table, these external actors. Really, in my mind, they're trying to, to really uh, protect their own interests and to really sideline these more um, popular uh, sort of, um, and I, I say radical here in the most positive sense, right? Um, actors, civilian actors like the unions, like the resistance committees there, that have, have said time and time again, stop legitimizing these war criminals by putting them on the negotiation table. These need to be, they, they need to be tried in a Sudanese court um, and they need to not be negotiating, right? Because what it does is it legitimizes them further and it allows them to kind of be framed as these potential reformists that could uh, bring us closer to democracy. When in reality, what has happened time and time again is any time there's been any movement towards uh, kind of more uh, civilian elite kind of um, power, right? They've either staged a massacre or a coup. And so they are obviously not to be trusted. And that's, I think, um, where UNITAMs also and um, the kind of external uh, uh, engagement, right, in negotiations made a huge, I don't know, say mistake, but, you know, uh, in trusting that they would get us any closer to democracy and where the resistance committees have very from the very beginning been very clear that to put them at the negotiation table essentially means moving us further and further away from the possibility of getting to a popular democracy that Sudan really deserves. And I just want to say in terms of the humanitarian crisis, Sudan has been home to over 1.1 million refugees, one of the largest refugee populations in, in Africa, um, the majority of which were from South Sudan, but also Eritrea, Ethiopia, um, Yemen, uh, Syria, right? And so what we've seen is with this uh, crisis happening, the war happening right now, is we moved from being a host country to now almost uh, 900,000 being displaced, right? Internally and also moving, you know, to the borders, Egypt, Ethiopia, Chad, etc. Um, and that, of course, has a huge destabilizing effect also on the region. And I think for me, that is why I agree with our colleague that um, any type of international engagement moving forward needs to be guided by people on the ground, specifically those who are sidelined in this negotiation process, who from the very beginning knew not to trust these generals and who also have a political platform, a very sophisticated one, um, about how to move forward, right? The first thing we need to do is to stop fighting, to cease this fighting. And the way to do that, to me, is to, to, to you know, um, to pressure these generals to stop fighting is to freeze their assets, to stop the kind of uh, external uh, uh, support of these two factions um, as they're, you know, because that's partly what allows them to continue fighting, right? To, to sort of um, not put them on the negotiation table, but, but get rid of the things that are allowing them to continue fighting. Um, and that needs to be a unified, coherent, coordinated international response that needs to be led in my view by the regional multilateral agencies like the AU, even though it hasn't always played the most positive role, and we can get into that later, um, or, and, or EGAD, right, in part because these regional multilateral agencies and, and the regional countries, there's a lot more at stake for them, right? We need a stable Sudan in order for the region to stabilize as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, um, I'm trying to see if, see if there's anything else. I would like to talk at some point about the rural economy, but that we might not have time for that. Yeah. Come back to thanks, uh, Nisri, for a very powerful intervention and how uh, how the external actors have really inflamed the situation where they could have actually tried to help uh, with the de escalation. Matt, I want to jump to you if you want to, to add to the external uh, uh, actors uh, component. And also, maybe perhaps you can expand specifically on, on Egypt, uh, because compared to the other countries in the GCC, the GCC countries have influence but are not neighboring countries. Egypt, of course, is a neighboring country and will suffer from, uh, from any 
spillover economically uh, as well as in terms of humanitarian crisis. So perhaps if you can expand on Cairo's uh, approach so far, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, I th I think the overarching point, you know, to build off of Nasreen is again, um, it's 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 imprinted in the orthodoxies of international mediation um, across the board. You know, when I speak to my Libyan colleagues and I tell them about Sudan, a country that I focus on, they they're just like, oh my God, it sounds exactly like our scenario. Um, and and what they mean by that is that the the mechanisms of bringing um, generals, war criminals, people that have committed grave crimes against humanity, people that have upended former political processes. Um, we've seen that in both contexts, um, for instance, um, be brought back into the fold and trying to fix up Humpty Dumpty again, effectively. And what that does is, again, that that discourages and essentially disincentivizes civil politics. And what it does is that it incentivizes actually people to understand that if you pick up a weapon, if you form a group, if you cause havoc, you'll be brought to the negotiating table and you'll get a position in the next government. So what we're doing is that the orthodoxies of mediation need to be fundamentally rethought, not just in terms of Sudan, but Sudan is just another example of how a country has been actually become more militarized due to not, I think, any kind of, to be honest, I think it doesn't matter if it's the AU, if it's EGAD, if it's the US, whoever it is, if you're employing the same tools, because that's the orthodoxy of mediation, you're going to get a very similar result. So yes, actors are important, but the fundamental tool needs to be rethought and reconfigured as well. So like, I'll, I'll, I'll stop on that front. Um, in terms of Egypt, uh, Egypt, yeah, uh, listen, not to go too much at length of it, but Egypt tends to take what it sees as its security interests and its security view of the region through what it believes is a very pragmatic view of that. And so Egypt sees security in very much, uh, you know, an ideological, ideational way, uh, but but fueled very much by pragmatism always, also. So in Egypt's internal, um, you know, politics, it sees the military institution as first and foremost, the supreme sovereign institution. And this is an institution that it likes to make inroads with either military outfits elsewhere in the region or outfits that are attempt to be military. For instance, we can see General Haftar in Libya, and we can obviously see the longstanding legacies and relationships with the military in Sudan. So it's no secret to them that um, Egypt would be uh, very much both from a pragmatic sense, but also in the way that it views its own security and how it reacts to that um, and, and its behavior and its foreign policy to be backing military institutions uh, across the region. Uh, in the case of Sudan, it has longstanding, even though they've had some turbulence and in, in obviously in the past in the, in the era of Bashir, despite that, even in the era of Bashir, there was longstanding security interests there was long-standing um, uh, economic cooperation interests. Um, there have been interests on on a, on a number uh, uh, cooperation on a number of files that are quite quite entrenched between the two actors. Um, in the way that I think Egypt is now viewing um, displacement, for instance, I think it's coming to a detriment uh, of themselves. I think uh, the crisis at the border is them again viewing migration and and the refugee crisis. Through um, you know through security lens, I think it's them seeing things through national security perspective, and I think in a way actually from the perspective uh, 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 from the the Egyptian regime, it's actually counterproductive to their own interests. This is an opportunity for them to let in aid organizations, to have donor money flow into the country, to be able to essentially um, show itself, to be able to play a very much, uh, uh, you know, constructive role in hosting a, a neighboring country and, and being able to have, you know, both political soft power, but also economics flow into that as a result of that, which would actually, I think, benefit the, the government at this point, you know, when I'm just speaking of things through their perspective. Uh, so I think it's actually the way that they're treating it is part of a long-standing tradition of seeing things through security lens. But I think it's counterproductive to how they could actually benefit through much more humane policy towards uh, refugees at the border, in my in my view. Um, what was the other? Did you have another question? Uh, I'm no, sorry. 
I think that's good. We actually thank you for alluding. There's many questions from the audience. Thank you a lot for the engagement. I think we we need to start tackling some of those uh, uh, questions. There was an online question uh, to Reddy uh, that was sent ahead. Uh, what can the role of the, the African Union uh, be, uh, if any? And also, uh, can UNITAMs play a bigger role over the next uh, uh, period? So, to you, Reddy, first. Yeah. Uh, well. There is a structural arrange arrangement within the African Union that is first stage to be uh, dealt by the regional economic community then to the African Union. In this case, it is IGAD, which is supposed to deal with the problem in Sudan then from IGAD to the African Union. But the problem is both the regional organization IGAD as well as the African Union are in a way uh, weak to deal such kind of problem where there are international uh, actors involved. Uh, so from the very beginning, the IGAD have been saying they will send delegation representing IGAD uh, by head of states from uh, South Sudan, Kenya and Djibouti. Uh, of course, it was not possible to, to send to, to Khartoum, uh, but also the African Union has been pushing uh, by using IGAD as well as using its own mechanism. Uh, so the problem now uh, has become a, a bit more uh, larger than what IGAD and the African Union can do. Uh, I think when we talk about external actors, uh, probably uh, we, we should not be naive. Uh, there is a pure altruism because states have their own interests. Uh, so as long as have their own interests, uh, no matter how much they could be uh, altruistic, always there is an element of their own interests. Uh, so uh, for me, which I'm going again and again to stress is uh, at the end, even though this is an urgent, the war has to stop, the suffering of people, the destruction of property, destruction of Khartoum to, has to stop, but the, the solution has to come from within the, 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 the Sudanese society. Now, uh, our, our, our sister was saying about the popular revolution. We know 1964, it was a popular revolution, but that revolution could not address the issue of identity and the issue of the state. And the civilian political powers parties failed. Then we had the 1969 uh, coup. Then we have in 1985, a popular revolution, which brought uh, Sadiq al-Mahdi to, to, to power, but still those sectarian uh, traditional political parties also failed. And then we have in 1989, the coup. This tells us the fundamental problem is issue of identity, issue of state building. How do you build the state and identity uh, question? So I think, uh, we can agree there is an urgent need of stopping the war, but fundamentally we should not depend what the uh, UN should do, what the African Union should do, what EGA should do, what the international community should do, because all these countries have their own, uh, all forces have their own uh, agenda, their own interests. So basically, uh, I think the Sudanese has to be able to address the crisis of state, the crisis of identity. So how do we deal with identity, with uh, state building? Those are the, the fundamental elements for me. Great, thanks, Reddy. And it's great to end this way to uh, your intervention to refocus the discussion now on the uh, domestic component. We have an excellent question that I'll direct you, Nasreen. Is there a civil group that has popular and international legitimacy and uh, that can represent a real alternative to military rule? Um, well, let me just start by saying, I think, um, oh, sorry, I just let them off. Okay, so to answer this particular question, yes. I mean, I think they, um, 
there is, as I as I mentioned, there's a uh, eight thousand um, resistance committees that are that have put out a revolutionary charter in the past that have kind of put out political platforms that don't necessarily always represent the same politics, but are unified around certain um, kind of uh, yeah. Uh, ideas um, that very much, I think, represent the majority, um, at least from from the people that I've talked to, right, um, sort of what what people think needs to happen moving forward. And I think, I mean, I want to make one point clear, because I talked earlier about international actors, I'm talking right now about merely ceasing the fighting, right, that we need international pressure for that. Because I, I mean, clearly, uh, people on the ground, I was there in Sudan being surrounded by gunfire, etc. We're not going to be able to get these war generals to stop fighting. Um, and because, and in part because of these external actors that have been entrenched and sort of embedded for so long in Sudan, even before the revolution. So um, I think there is a responsibility there, given the negative international intervention that has happened, um, for, for there to be external pressure to, to, to get them to, to stop fighting. After that, I mean, again, I'm not a political analyst, but I question whether or not um, any kind of negotiation that is externally um, supported or, or, you know, where international actors are engaged makes sense because it hasn't worked so far. As we've talked about, it's not only about, um, you know, uh, negotiations, but also the tools being used to negotiate. And if anybody, you know, for those of us who have studied Sudan's uh, history of, of political agreement and negotiations, uh, in relation to, you know, the comprehensive peace agreement, for example, um, we see that external actors have not played uh, a positive role, right? And so um, in mediating even, I'm talking about just the mediation role here. So I think for me, that is a question. Again, being an anthropologist, perhaps I'm being, you know, naive here, but to me, I don't think the path forward uh, should look anyway, in any shape or form, uh, close to what we've had in the past, because it clearly has not worked. I think moving forward, we need to listen to um, the resistance committees and the, the unions that have been sidelined from this kind of the, the handpicked civilian elites that were part of this protracted negotiation process. The people who have been left out, basically, they um, have, you know, have their own form of coalition that we can uh, turn to now and, and allow them, you know, the, the ones who have been called unrealistic and naive, etc. Um, let's see, right? Let's see um, what, um, you know, what, let's actually listen to the, the charter that they've set out, to the platforms that they've put out, um, and, and have it be an internal process. That even in terms of these war criminals, right, they need to be tried within Sudan. And that has to be tied, I think, also to another demand of the popular re revolution, which has to do with the constitution. Um, and so I think these are all things that need to be um, internally uh, built. I think we have models, for example, from Latin America that um, people can look at for how um, some of these processes have worked in a more internal fashion. Um, but again, I'm not an expert on these things, but yes, to answer that question, we do have credible um, sort of civilian uh, elements here that that, that uh, have for the most part been sidelined and need to be centered. Great, thanks, Isri. Matt, there are a number of questions that are alluding to like uh, social, uh, ethnic, uh, ideological uh, divisions given the, uh, the somewhat complicated composition. Uh, of uh, Sudan. How do you see these factors playing out uh, and could they be overcome uh, in some of the committees and some of the, the political forces that uh, Nisreen uh, has mentioned? Oh, uh, yeah, good question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, but <laughs> No, I, I just want to qualify uh, one thing, just to build on one thing Nasreen said that I just feels really important to stress not to. Uh, I, 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 I think also when we're looking at uh, alternatives in terms of um, alternatives to the generals, and alternatives within the, the, the civilian actors, um, we have to replace the concept of an actor or replace the idea of a personality and start to look through Sudan. And I would argue more look at politics and civilian politics more generally through structures. What structures that are developed right now or that are developing can be engaged in? And is there new imaginary ways to engage with these structures? Because if there are structures to begin with, then this is going to have an embedded legitimacy on a community and city level, because they already had to have that legitimacy or, or credibility from their communities to reach the level of development that they've reached already. So this is a far safer bet and far less 
unrealistic in my view. It's actually much more realistic to solve the question of the crisis of legitimacy of a state by already interacting with legitimate structures on the ground, as opposed to personality politics, which by its very nature bypasses existing structures. And then actually this is where we fall back into questions and crises of state legitimacy. I'll just, that's just one thing I wanted to add there. I think in terms of ideology and, um, you know, uh, ethnic permutations and ethnic makeups across the country, full disclosure, it's not really my expertise, but what I would say is um, I think there are absolutely, particularly in Darfur right now, historical grievances, but these grievances are still being my fears are going to be, um, one, exasper exacerbated in some arenas. I mean, Darfur is huge. But in other cases, I think we're going to see um, new reconfigurations of how um, of how conflict can begin to take an ethnic face. So what I mean by that in detail, or as an example, is that Nasreen talked about the history, for instance, of um, you know the Janjaweed and how uh, there was mass slaughters and accusations of genocide that took place that did on the that did on the whole start to target and take an ethnic face of conflict a number of different communities particularly in Janaina, particularly in the West Darfur, Al Fasha, a number of different areas. And we see these grievances still here today. There are reports, incredible reports now, that there are um, you know, Arab nomads or, or nomads within Niala that are being essentially arbitrarily arrested immediately by the army in order to uh, disincentivize them from joining the RSF without really any under understanding of the internal tribal politics or what was being said by, um, you know, members of the native administration or activists within that community as well that were actually raising the alarm weeks before the conflict took place of military recruitment within uh, within their own communities and base as a, as a way of divide and conquering and playing on, on old political rivals within their community. And as a result of that, what we're seeing now is this profiling on one end, while the military is also what I'm hearing from local journalists and, and sources on the ground, is pushing a number of other um, uh, communities that yes, have legitimate fears with mobilizing themselves in Niala, but also pushing them um, and actors within them to settle scores. So we're seeing as a reconfiguration, actually, where the army before supported the Janjaweed in Niala um, far back in 2003 and four, but now we're seeing risks of, okay, the army playing on the opposite side of the grievances in order for them to attack the RSF, but because there's already the arbitrary arrests of a number of, of nomads and Arabs at the same time, we wonder at the same time, can this also take ethnic face of conflict? In Janaina, the west of Darfur, we're seeing the opposite, actually. What we're seeing is um, a, a, what I would first classify as a protection issue, and, uh, and in the Yala and Fasha as well, but most starkly in Janaina. And the grounds to these conflicts are never, like conflict, I believe, takes an ethnic face. The, the, uh, there are political and ethnic grievances over time, but they're fundamental uh, over the politics of resources, land disputes, water disputes as well. But then you mix with that the militarization, particularly of West Darfur over time. And this is where we're going to get a very uh, combustible conflict. And on top of that, you are going to have significantly more vulnerable populations than other populations. And so what we're seeing is that we're having a number of, of uh, internally displaced camps, uh, the army is not stepping in to protect them whatsoever. They've never stepped in to protect anybody. And we're having, um, you know, we say the RSF, and I want to say the RSF, but I think the, the, the lines of conflict in Khartoum are very concrete for now. The lines of conflict in uh, West Darfur um, are, are, much, are much more blurry. Because again, the military and the RSF, they're foremost employers. A lot of people from my understanding and, and the tribes from, uh, um, and the communities attacking right now, the internally displaced from other ethnic uh, communities that they identify as in West Darfur, they're actually from a different clan within Hemeti's Arab tribe, actually. And they're actually, they're more loyal to another leader who's the original Janjaweed leader named Musa Halal. But at the same time, you have members within these communities that, of course, fight for the RSF because the RSF pays well. 
And when it's in time and conflict, there's going to be members of the RSF and the RSF is going to recruit and give them logistics. And they have uh, that provides these communities with credibility to go with official uniforms or with not official uniforms and start to commit very grave acts of violence in order to try to consolidate their control over more land, over more water resources. And then what this is leading to is that communities with no choice and no protection West R4 are militarizing themselves. So we see again, like we cannot reduce this to ethnic conflict and we cannot reduce this to, to binary political categories at the same time. There is a whole history that I'm not incredibly uh, well versed of, of, of very much localized disputes, both within communities and between communities. And then what we're seeing is that the face of the national conflict is interconnecting and shaping this, but also being shaped by it as well. So it's a bit it's a bit complex, but the main thing I'll stress is that it's a massive protection issue, both from a humanitarian and security uh, lens. These people that are being attacked, particularly in West Darfur, they have no recourse absolutely to protection. It's open season on them, and this is raising significant fears among people in the community of a 2.0 of what happened in 03. And just very much like what happened in 03, when much of the attention was on the CPA and the, uh, the, the 2005 agreement, very little attention is being paid at all right now to the conflict in Darfur internationally, I think among mediators, I think about calls of ceasefires. And, and we're just seeing the Sudan conflict as Khartoum. And of course, Khartoum is important. But let's not repeat the same mistakes twice of neglecting a crisis that could become completely out of control in Darfur. Great, thanks, uh, Matt. I'll jump to you, ready if you want to add to the discussion on the domestic uh, component. Uh, but there's also a question on uh, the GERD dam uh, and how Ethiopia is viewing all of this. So if you want to tackle that as well, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, when it comes to whether there are internal forces uh, besides the two military or the military. Uh, I think Sudan is very unique in the region uh, because Sudan has a very liberal culture and there is a long history of trade union on the syndicates. We have seen it in 1964 in 1985. So you have a well-established civil society, well-organized, uh, very active, very vibrant, but also the culture itself is a very uh, progressive and very liberal culture. Uh, the problem is during the last 30 years, the Ungaz government has destroyed that vibrant society. Otherwise, uh, when in 1985 there was a a popular uprising against Anemere. I was in Khartoum myself, uh, and I have seen that uh, vibrant, popular uh, movement. And anyone who knows the, the region and Sudan would understand uh, Sudan has a history of a very vibrant uh, trade unionist. And it was a trade unionist with the women, students, uh, workers, who rise and then uh, the, the, the current regime collapses. Uh, that is one. Uh, another dimension is, I think we should not forget, um, Sudan has more than 200 ethnic groups. And these 200 ethnic groups, except the people around Khartoum, have always been marginalized and outside the state power corridor. And that is one of the uh, most important elements. Whenever there is an uprising, uh, it is to address that uh, in exclusion, that marginalization, which both the civilian political parties and the military were not able to, to, to address until now. Uh, in terms of ideology, we have both the, the UMA party or the unions party, their own <clears throat> ideology. You have even what is very unique when it comes to Sudan, the communist part of Sudan has been functioning throughout the history, even during an Umari, during Umar al-Bashir and until now, which is very unique to, to Sudan. You have uh, other ideologies, the Nasrists, uh, the Ba'asists. 
So there is also, it's not only the ethnic uh, groups, but also the different political ideologies. Uh, so it is a layer of different ideologies, ethnicity, uh, whatever uh, configuration we can give it. When it comes to the, uh, um, the girls, well, from a technical perspective, uh, I'm not sure whether the feeling of the dam is going to affect Sudan as well as Egypt. Uh, I think one of the uh, idea which both sides, the Ethiopian and the Sudanese in Egypt should take into consideration is the technical aspect. What are uh, technically, how is it going to affect the water flow to Egypt particularly? And, and Sudan, unless it is for political reasons, I think feeling the, the, the dam has uh, two important aspects for Sudan. One is the, the annual uh, flow of water, which caused a lot of devastation in Khartoum, could be resolved. Uh, secondly, there is the issue of uh, electricity, which uh, Sudan is going to benefit from that. Uh, so I don't know for Sudan, in fact, until uh, the fall of Umar al-Bashir, uh, the Umar al-Bashir government was siding with Ethiopia. And whenever you talk to scholars of Khartoum, they will tell you our interest is with the policy of Ethiopia than the policy of uh, Egypt. So for me, uh, I think both sides should need or need to have a, a technical understanding and a technical study of what is the real consequence of filling the dam. And now it's already uh, more or less uh, filled. I don't know, more than 70% has been filled. Uh, so the rest is not uh, much problematic to, to do it. And I I can't see any technical uh, reason or rationality affecting the water flow to, to Egypt and Sudan. Thanks, Freddy. We have uh, three minutes. So we'll have one minute for a uh, per speaker for a quick answer, perhaps to the most important question we, we received today uh, by email. Uh, how can we support Sudan in such challenging uh, times? International community, individuals, uh, and so on. Ms. Reed. Well, I just wanted to, add, if I may, I just wanted to say something about sort of ethnicity and the way it's been mobilized um, to sort of suppress dissent. Um, we didn't really get a chance to talk about Hassan al-Turabi, the sort of political ideologue behind the al-Bashir regime, but I think it's important to mention that, that you know, they formed a sort of ethno-nationalist um, state. I mean, it exists, it pre-existed uh, the Bashir regime, but that was sort of imposed yeah, a kind of ethno-nationalism, monocultural project on a very multi-ethnic um, country that, that we still see the legacy of that. And I think I want to point people to Jok Madud Jok's work and Amir Idris's work, um, who are both historians that can tell you more about how ethnicity in particular is mobilized to squash dissent and to extract resources to the benefit of elites. I think in terms of what we can do, um, I mean, to me right now, the resistance committees have been the ones who have filled a gap uh, of a pretty much non-existent humanitarian response. Um, and, and they've done so in a, in a really um, incredible way. And I would say we need to support um, local efforts, the doctor's union, for example, in, uh, in sort of stepping up that humanitarian response and certainly uh, you know, get the international community to actually respond. We need the borders to be opened. Um, and as I said, we need pressure to to stop this fighting before the fighting stops, uh, you know, until that happens, there's no way we can get uh, to the next step right and so and that next step then needs to be guided by Sudanese people on the ground that's um, pretty much I think all I have to say on that. People Thanks. to people solidarity is what I think needs to happen right now. Solidarity is very, very important. Uh, Matt to you. Uh, Matt camera. Uh, yes. Um, okay, so yeah, what can we do? Well, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, the first thing that we can do, I think, from a humanitarian situation is direct cash assistance. Uh, we have to find local channels to resistance committees and to unions and the doctor's union to build off what Nasreen said, 
right now, they're the ones on the front line. Yes, I get it. Um, World Food Program has resumed aid. It's doing what it can do in Gadar, if it's doing what it can do in the East, but a number of aid organizations still due to um, due to understandable security concerns, aren't able to make it to the most hard hit areas. Who is, who's doing that work? They need money because everything is incredibly expensive right now on the black market. And every time I'm hearing things, where can we get fuel? Where, how do, how are we supposed to purchase medicine? There's no, there's no um, uh, insulin. Okay, the, 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 there has to be an ability between donor states from a humanitarian perspective, working with NGOs to be like the best possible people that can deliver these services right now, that have their own accountability mechanisms, are the resistance committees, are these unions, um, are these people that are running hospitals? How do we support them with direct cash assistance? I think that's absolutely imperative right now. Uh, the second thing that I would say is yes, I think we also need to work on, um, uh, I think there needs to be inroads for the day after, right? So there needs to be inroads immediately with uh, a, a number of um, trade unions, particularly the journalist union, I think the medical union, these are elected accordingly. And I think that there should be efforts um, in order to engage with as many uh, coalitions of the resistance committees as possible. So there's 8,000, how can we do it? They've set up coordination committees, go through the coordination committees, and then they're going to be able to communicate their views accordingly as a cohesive unit. That's what the coordination committee is for. Do not go and take one and then take the other and just people and just like single pick people go and work through the structures they've built. And then that way you'll be able to get more homogenized answers that reflect a little bit more um, of, of uh, you know, the, the views and perspectives and, and the stances that resistance committees, I think, take. I think that's also imperative. The third thing, monitoring. There's, where's the one, okay, we don't, we're, we're monitoring some of the situation in Khartoum, but then we're not paying attention to the monitors. We're saying ceasefires work and ceasefires aren't working. We're saying that, uh, uh, you know, we're congratulating people for partial ceasefires when they're still killing people. Do you know what I mean? So this is the first thing. There has to be integrity, I think, on the international level to call a spade a spade and not to essentially um, create a, a larger climate of impunity by essentially um, using nice liberal language as a smoke cover to, you know, see things that we want to see as a nice illusion when that's not actually what's taking place on the ground. Meanwhile, there's absolutely no monitoring anywhere else. You know, you, you ask me ask questions about Darfur. The plain issue is we don't know. We don't know the scope of it. We don't know the scope of it because there's no monitoring there. So there has to be a way to create new mechanisms, to start monitoring abuses there. There has to be some way of doing that. Uh, and this is something that a number of human rights organizations have been calling for, because at least then we'll be ready if conflict starts to get to the point where God knows it becomes quite catastrophic or that becomes the new main arena of conflict moving forward, whether or not that's in Kordofan, whether or not that's in Darfur, but we need to be ready for that. And to be ready for that, we need to be able to monitor that. Um, finally, okay. I would say local, like work through, okay, you're working through the resistance committees as part of getting their stance uh, and their input in terms of how to conduct more national mediations, whether or not there's consensus, I think, things need to go through the most credible structures and institutions right now um, to get consensus over, okay, should there be sanctions? Should there not be sanctions? It's easy for us. I think there's grounds for debates for it, for debates against it. What should they look like? I think we need to hear from people on the ground. We have to go through those coordination, coordination committees accordingly. Um, you know, I'm personally in favor of targeted sanctions, but I'm not going to speak and advocate that as a policy without, I think, getting the insight of resistance committees on the ground. Meanwhile, in other areas, the most effective um, structures that have stopped any kind of violence so far has actually been local initiatives within al Fasher and Niala to some extent. They were the only ones that saw a pause and some uh, ceasefire. They need to be supported. Empower those structures as opposed to neglect them or try to go just through uh, big politics, national solutions. I think on all of those files, we could make a lot of headway to mitigate this conflict and potentially bring this to a ceasefire. Thanks, uh, Matt. We've run out of time, but uh, already briefly, if you, you want to jump in on the, the way forward and what can we do? 
Well, uh, probably two things. One is, um, let me refer to a book which was uh, written in 1985 by the Sudanese professor Harir, where he says there is no shortcut for Sudan. That is most important to, to, to understand. Uh, now we have both the long-term and proximate problems. When it comes to the proximate problems, uh, we have also to acknowledge the limit of international communities. The international communities could only help the Sudanese people. Uh, otherwise, there is also, also uh, limitation what the international community can do unless they are willing to come in with military forces. Second, the, another point which I want to mention is the military is to be reckoned. We cannot simply exclude it and say, we will have a solution unless we are ready to come in the military force and uh, probably uh, dismantle the, the both the RSF and the National Army. So the National Army is to be reckoned. And for me, all the stakeholders have interest in sitting together, discussing, negotiating, and finding both proximate and long-term solution. Thanks, uh, Reddy. Nasreen, as the only Sudanese on, on this panel, the, the final uh, word is uh, is yours briefly, please. Yeah, I mean, one thing I want to say is just for people to educate themselves. I mean, I kept my answers fairly vague and, or like general because I think it's important to actually, you know, I can give you a list, a reading list to educate yourself about Sudanese history and kind of what led up to this moment. Um, I also think the question of what happens next needs to not even be posed to me, but to people on the ground. Um, I think that's one of the mistakes that we've made in the past is to, you know, ask experts uh, who are maybe less connected to the ground, um, what that looks like. And then finally, I want to say something about the rural areas and the rural economy. We're about to come up, um, you know, the rainy season is about to start. To start. Um, and I think we're dealing both with how that will complicate people's ability to exit and, and, you know, move, but also in terms of food production. And I think part of that has to do, of course, with a long legacy of a kind of gutting of the agricultural sector, either through war or through this kind of neoliberal turn of removing state subsidies and supports to small farmers. And so what we've seen really is that in situations like this, and we've seen this in Haiti and other places, where humanitarian aid then gets dumped onto uh, local markets, and that can even further exacerbate uh, food security in the region. So I want to also caution us against that. Even in terms of the humanitarian response, we need it to be Sudanese-led, and that's partly why I think it's so important, uh, back to Matt's point, that we support the unions, not only in cities, there's also farmers unions and other kinds of um, committees uh, of agricultural workers, for example, that I've worked with that need support at the moment. Of course, it's difficult because the banking system has essentially collapsed, and that has partly to do with the international sanctions uh, system that, that uh, led us to that moment and, and uh, other reasons, but that also needs to open up, right? We need to be able to open up channels to bring that support into Sudan at the moment. Um, and and I, so, yeah, I'll just end there. And I think I, I also want to say, I mean, to me, what the revolution has achieved has been incredibly inspiring. And we cannot let go of that hope. We don't have the privilege to, to, to sort of lose hope in the situation, right? The problem has been that we have not given them the, the sort of, um, the, the, the really, we've, we've hindered them from getting to the next step, right, in this revolution. And that's, I think, where we need to be looking to the future. Thank you, Thank you very much, Nasreen. And this is the perfect ending, I think, to this, uh... Uh, excellent panel. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for joining us. It's been a great discussion. The discussion will continue. We may even invite our panelists to contribute uh, a post or a blog post to uh, our continued coverage of the issue here at the Middle East Council. We've, num we've published a piece uh, by our experts that my colleague has shared here. We have a number of other pieces focused on the role of GCC, but we may also invite uh, our speakers here for posts uh, in uh, very soon, uh, inshallah. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our thoughts and prayers of the people of Sudan as we continue uh, looking and viewing this issue. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.